All right. And for those of you who are just joining us for the next presentation, or those of you who may have stayed from the previous, this is Let's Learn Live, part of the Electronic Village here at uh, TESOL 2022. Um, and we are excited for our next presentation. It looks like she is set up, logged in, and has her camera on. So I will introduce her and we will dive right in. Up next, we have uh, Peggy Simonson, and she is going to be talking to us about uh, digitally annotating text to foster reading, writing connections and collaboration. Um, she's going to be demonstrating some specific tools, including hypothesis to annotate text in a shared cloud-based digital format to foster reader response, reading and writing as reciprocal processes, analysis of text and virtual collaboration for reading. And she is going to be um, walking us through a lot of the possibilities of these tools and looking for your inputs along the way, audience. So we hope to hear from you as well. Welcome, Peggy. Hi, how are you? Doing great, thank you. Awesome, can everybody um, see my screen? Perfect. Okay. Hi, I'm glad to be here. I think I'm the last presentation. I love that this is being recorded on YouTube. And so this is digitally annotating text to foster reading, writing connections and collaboration. I also have the chat up on a second screen. And if you look in the chat, maybe scroll up a tiny bit, you can see the slides. I have a couple QR codes. So we have your phones handy. And if you are already, um, if you already have an account on Hypothesis, then go ahead and log in and you can annotate with us along the way. We'll do a couple of demos and I have a, a quick poll at the beginning. So again, I love um, text annotation on the web because it gets us into paperless classrooms. There's, there's just a ton of reasons to do it. Um, it, it involves reader response. So kind of open-ended interpretation reading and writing connections, and then analysis. So it gets, it hits Bloom's taxonomy on different levels, and then there's collaboration opportunities. So thanks everyone for, for joining. And then what do you hope to learn or what what is your interest in this topic? If it's new to you, tell us that, but let's just take a couple seconds in the chat and just type your own interest in digital, social, text annotation. What do you guys think? New? Okay, good. So you'll learn. And I'll share the free version of Hypothesis, which is web annotation. Um, and then it's also available as an embedded tool in your LMS if your institution sponsors it. Yeah, so it's new. So you can go to the website, um, which is also linked there. And then I see I have used Cami. Okay, so I'll tell a bit about myself because I'm also here to network. Um, so I'm a former K-12 school teacher, bilingual ESL in California and Austin, and I was in teacher education, and now I'm in T-cell education, and my role in teacher education was literacy, so I love reading and writing, um, and I've been teaching mostly online since 2008, so many years, and please follow me or feel free to tag me on Twitter during or after this presentation. Um, Okay, so just anything else you wanna add about this topic? Have you used social digital annotation tools? Yes, no, maybe. Um, and I'm gonna kind of glance through our comments so far. Lisa says, I teach annotation on the ground. I would like my virtual students to annotate too. Yeah, I do high flex. And so this is a great way for them to connect in cyberspace. And then how can annotation enhance reading and writing? Yes, and Digo is another one that's, that's good for annotation. Students can also annotate on their own in order to dive deeper into the web-based text or PDF, any kind of text. Um, okay, so the socially shared annotation is just where people can see what other people are commenting on. Um, and it's usually purposeful and that kind of thing. Another one is genius.com where people annotate song lyrics or poetry. So those that's been popular too. And then um, Verska says, I believe writing is the most difficult skill. Yes, definitely. So it gets, gets students engaged. Um, I don't think Padlet is annotation per se. It's more like a um, just a, a commenting um, space. So hypothesis, again, it helps you to read closely. You can highlight the text 
that you want to comment on and then leave a comment. And it can be as simple as an emoticon. It can be an in-depth analysis. It's kind of what you want to pick. Okay, so here's what it looks like, um, the directions. I uh, did a screenshot. So uh, to create an annotation, you just highlight the text. And again, you can upload a, in, if you have it in your course or your, your learning management system, you can upload a PDF. Um, you can also use the web-based version and annotate websites. And you can choose if you want your comments to be public or not. So to create an annotation, highlight the text you want to comment on and click the quote button. Um, you know, some e some uh, Kindles and, and e-readers, they also have this feature where you can annotate. Has anyone done that where you can annotate on an e-book? So it's a lot similar to that. And you can also add a note um, and that kind of thing. So it's just a great um, tool. It's versatile. Um, et cetera. Okay, so think about it. We've been annotating for years. Anytime you write notes, um, has anyone seen a parent or somebody when slides were in their heyday would write notes all over it? You know, Jane on her birthday. Just annotation has been around for a very long time. Um, commenting in the margins of books has been around for a very long time. It's the same concept, except we're sharing that experience online. So it's highlighting adding notes, and it also involves reading or rereading, which lends itself to the idea of close reading. Um, yeah, someone said, I'm already winning. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so why, right? Everybody asks that with technology, um, especially those who are reluctant to use it. Like, why? Because it helps you to have network knowledge. Sometimes you just want to lurk and see what other people are thinking. If you've ever been in a book club, you know it's it can be useful to hear other people's ideas. You all read the same book, but you got something different out of it. Um, and I got just this quote from online, from the OER Commons. People do this to help build vocabulary, analyze material or content, express thoughts and ideas within the text, right? So we learn how to talk about the text. Um, sometimes we don't know how to do that. Like when I go to an art museum, I don't necessarily know how to talk about the art um, other than in, in a kind of simple, non-analytical way. Um, and so we have to learn how to do that. So it, it also, like I said, um, in the book club analogy, it adds insights through sharing, right? So we explain things. Um, it helps you build understanding. And that's where comprehension and the ESL connection comes in. You evaluate. And, it, and it's interesting. So it makes it meaningful. Um, okay, so just a few key resources, and um, you can come back to this later, um, is just the free web annotation feature on the Hypothesis website. You do have to create an account and log in. No, I just meant insights like, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> not, not a tool or anything, but it, it just helps us to have like life insights or insights about literature or poems or, or essays or that kind of thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, just to clarify, non-technical version of insights. Um, yeah, and then there's lessons online on how to annotate. Lots of resources. Um, okay, so here's where my background in literacy is gonna gonna be at work here. So students don't know. Students may be able to get on and figure out how to annotate, but they don't know what to say. And so, how do you support that? And you probably have all ages of students. Um, I mean, in, in our group or if you're watching the recording, so you can start with free form reader response. So remember, like I said, sometimes when I look at art, I don't really know what to think, you know, so you start with I liked it or what is this <laughs> and you work up from there towards more analytical. And so starting with the short and easy and as with any scaffolding working towards more complex annotations um, and modeling. So model it, share your annotation, go first you know, my turn and then your turn, and then students will learn from each other. Um, for narrative text and fiction, you can teach literary terms, of course, and then finding that good quality content online, right? Like not boring, not insipid or, you know, dry, but like finding rich content, as we all know, is key to engaging our learners and readers. And then, so curating good things to read and then helping them, they could even, have you seen, um, where people even just put like an exclamation point or a question mark, 
Um, and that's coding the text. And that can be simple, a simple beginning. And then finally, as we all know, some, some learners don't yet have this technology skills to do this. So start with sticky notes and print text and then work, you know, low tech to high tech, work towards things. And then they, you can also um, low tech annotate a picture. What are you seeing in the picture? Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip that about Charles stages of reading, but just this idea that, you know, in general, nonfiction text is trickier and it's gonna take a little more work um, to help students when you're annotating. So I'll share a couple examples now. Do we have any thoughts so far? What are you, what are you thinking so far? Um, let me look. Okay, the, I, those were the other questions. Okay, any more thoughts? All right, so I'm gonna jump into some demos and then we'll kind of debrief in this fast paced journey. Okay, so where I'm from, um, has anyone used this? It's a simple poem, and I'm not gonna do it justice because I just have a, a little screenshot, um, but it's by George Ella Lyon, and she writes about her roots in it. People can kind of relate to the poem's themes um, and that kind of thing. And it's used for as a model or a mentor text for readers to read and then write their own where I'm from poem. So one great thing to do is have students analyze the poem so that they can think about how to write their own where I'm from poem, that whole idea of mentor text. So it's a good reading writing connection. So you pull up the poem. In this case, I pulled it up in Canvas as a PDF document. And I had like 50 students. Um, and look at the date, March 2020, woo, right before the pandemic happened. Um, and so I had them, we did this in class, actually, this was for an on-campus class um, right before the pandemic. And so I went first and I, she says, I am from Clothespin. So I highlighted it and I added the, clicked the quote mark and I put a little comment. I said, this makes me think of the region she's from, reminds me of my own grandmother who hung up clothespins in Alaska. So, um, and I could have gone on because that was a strong memory for me of my grandma in the cold of winter hanging up stuff on the clothesline, even though she could have gone to the laundromat. Um, yeah, so it can be personal connections. It can be analysis. Um, so like you can see one of, one of the comments below that is, is a little deeper. It gets into the text itself, right? So readers can read within the text or they can read beyond the text. And my annotation was beyond the text and the next person was within the text. And that's okay because I think I had just introduced this to them. So it was a little more free form. And um, Amal says annotation is a good way to enhance critical reading. Yeah, yeah. And Joanne has used this um, poem before too. It's kind of popular. Um, okay, so again, I just gave some simple directions and I had them work in groups because I just wasn't sure they all had the tech savvy, um, you know, and that kind of thing. And I had a very large class and I didn't have time to run around and <laughs> help people. So I said, I just get, I said, you can do personal response, comment or question, literary analysis, observation of the author's writing. So, you know, the craft of writing or comment about the poetry structure. Some people love, you know, how things are organized and that kind of thing. So. Then I had them, after they did their annotation or comment in the side, I had them read through other people's comments. And then, um, then I also encouraged them to listen to it to get those modalities in. And then I let them know we'll be using hypothesis and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> and I think, I think I did end up, we continued to use it because we were on Canvas anyway. Um, okay, any thoughts? Okay, so here are the demos. This is just a screenshot. Um, there's lots of text online. Poetry Foundation has good poems. And this, was, this is a web-based annotation. And these annotations that are here, um, they are already there, they're public. So um, it should pop up, yeah, because I'm still logged in as Peggy Simmingson. Um, and let me see if, yeah, my comment is here. And I just did a simple one. So we real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight. Um, I remember when I read this poem for the first time, I always wondered why she put the we at the end. So I'm gonna put that there. And so you can see it did a pop-up, which is convenient because you don't have to click over 
Um, oops, I lost it. So let me go back. Okay, click in the box. What did I forgot what I said already? <laughs> Why is the word we at the end of the sentence? So that's a structural question. Okay, and I'm not going to worry too much about um, spelling. Okay, and then I can preview it. I can, you know, you know, edit it a little bit, add a picture. I that's too fancy for me. So I just hit post. Um, and I can delete it, like if I'm like, oh no, I, I, I don't like that, or I've grown in my analysis since then, you know, you can delete it. Um, so that is editing. And what I did is I just went to um, the hypothesis um, website and you click on web dot hypothesis, hypo it's kind of a weird spelling, the dot is between the S and the I, and you just click paste a link and paste your link in there. And it and it sets it up for you so that you can you can do that. So um, if you want to join us um, on this, I think I have the link in here. So let me see. If you want to join us, you can try it yourself on that poll. I'm gonna put the link in the chat. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one just for time. Um, so we did that one, um, a different genre. Let's see, let's go to the Omicron one. So this one is again, not poetry. You might read it to them and they read it together, you know, listen to it, however you, you have your learners learn. Um, and then do the, do the web annotation after modeling. Um, so, you know, different genres have different text demands of the reader. And then, um, you know, so just modeling that and, and you know, alerting them to things like captions. I'm going to annotate the captions. So I had one here. I had highlighted it and then clicked the quote and said, um, performers wearing face masks. And this is my real um, response. They're even still wearing masks outdoors. COVID is still present, right? Because there's that debate, like, are we done yet? <laughs> so I just put my honest annotation there. And then the great thing is someone can reply um, so it's just like in Canvas, click the little arrow. I agree. I mean, I hate the I agree stuff, but it's okay. So again, when you're first starting out, a little more free form is good, and then ramp up the modeling, give them the language um, to analyze. So that kind of thing. So again, you know, uh, conceptually dense things, vocabulary, are the annotations viewable only within your class group? So you can set up groups, that's a great, um, great thing. You can set up a group, so click new private group and you'll be able to set it up. They would need an account also. You cannot annotate anonymously. You have to have an account. So you can set up a new private group. I'm just doing public so you can see it. It's quick and easy. Um, and if, you're, if it's embedded in like Canvas, it's great because it's always there. So if, you know, again, if you have access to it and a site license in your thing, then it's great. Um, okay, and then finally, um, folklore. So just another example, um, it can be vocabulary. What exactly is an anti-hero? That was a non say the spider. Um, and it's got a, a little audio recording. So, um, you know, just some examples across genres to look at ways to paste a link into there, start create an account, paste a link, model it, and then invite you know, your group to participate in it. Um, but I recommend setting up a private group for that if you're considering it. So we did the demo, nonfiction, the folklore, literary, some other, um, let's see, excellent. That way we make sure everyone is being responsive. Yes being responsible for their comments. Um, or, okay, we answered the questions. There's another one called Perusal that I have not used. And then we had other recommendations, Digo. Um, and I forgot what the other one was, Cami, which is like a Google Chrome, I believe, or you can, you can get it as a Google Chrome extension, I think. I have not used that. And then as far as text, there's lots of free and public domain text to read or that are accessible to all levels of students and that kind of thing. So we mentioned other tools. See how we're doing on time. Okay, so I think we did get on time. I wondered what your um, questions and comments, concerns, ideas for trying it out, um, possibilities.
I think it's, it's a great way, especially if you're teaching writing, because you can analyze the genre, you can dig into the text, and then, and then that segues into writing. So you're reading with the lens of a writer. So for me, it's great for reading writing connections. Um, but it's also good just to, just to have them engage, because we know that comprehension is just interacting with text and getting into a deeper level. So any kind of critical reading is good. Uh, they just need some technical support and then modeling of the language of how to analyze. So yeah, hypothesis is great. Can you comment on others? Yes, so like I was showing um, before, so you can um, hit this little arrow and a reply will pop up. So. Um, and then I, you know, like I could, I agree, I'm just going to post it, I can delete it later, and then have a threaded discussion. So there, you know, I have not seen um, a lot of threaded discussions, but I haven't looked around enough while logged in on Hypothesis. So definitely, you can go in and annotate and it, it, you know, it's a great way for them to collaborate, be social, um, and that kind of thing. So I think that is all I had. Um, let me check my slides. Yeah, so any more questions? Comments? Let's scroll through. I don't see any. Oh, did you need to do any tool training to demonstrate the features? You mean like, did I have to get trained? I had a colleague that came about two years, it must have been before the pandemic. Um, and he did a demo for us. Um, it was actually in person, but there's, if you just go to YouTube and type in how to use hypothesis, you can also just either send that to your students or, or you can make your own five minute video. And the main thing is just grabbing the text. Well, it's deciding which text to grab, but technically grabbing the text and hitting the quote button. But like I said, they may have done that already on an e-reader. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for bringing um, these features to our attention, Peggy. Um, I'm I'm still a little fuzzy on the public versus group aspect. So if I am using a text with my class, if it is a popular text within mm -hmm. Hypothesis, is there a mm -hmm. chance that there's a lot of public comments jumbled up and it'll be hard to parse which ones come from our students? There could be, um, but just in my, you know, cursory look around with the public version, I haven't seen any like, you know, totally overloaded ones. It just, I think it depends on the text and the link. Great, thank you. That's a great, good question. And I see a few more questions about gamifying. I think you could, um, if others have thoughts, could you think of a way to gamify this? You know, numbers of comments, quality of comment, um, MVP, <laughs> most valuable player, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know of a way to quantify it, but if you can think of one, um, there's probably, you know, it's it's not as easy as like Kahoot or something. Oh, but I, um, yeah, or just setting their own goals. Yeah, I had an idea pop into my head, uh, Nestor, yeah. thanks for that question. Um, you could almost use it as a, um, a quest within a text where you give students maybe a list of things that they need to locate in a text. So maybe they're reading it, they get to a certain point and maybe they need to define whatever term you listed and maybe they need to um, find something that, uh, that they need to offer an opinion on in relation to how the author uses some literary elements. So you could almost like it, make it a, um, uh, a, a task list that they need to do accomplish with the annotations mm -hmm. to um, explore the text or some of the things that you're um, thinking about in uh, class. Yeah, I like, I like that, like a checklist or um, that kind of thing. Yeah, and then someone's, I don't know about notifications for the public version. Um, let's see, someone said a quest, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, and then hypothesis is text only for now. Last I checked, yeah, intellectual scavenger hunt. But like I said, the, the genius.com and poetry genius uh, are really popular, really, really popular. They've been around for, I don't know, seven, eight more years. Um, and you can, again, annotate song lyrics and also poetry. So the poetry one, obviously song lyrics are like poetry. 
but check out um, genius.com and poetry genius because those are totally public kind of open. It's similar, but um, I think they're interesting because the, people are real, <laughs> not that they're not real on hypothesis, but usually hypothesis is more for a class, whereas genius and poetry genius are like for fun, although they can be used in a class. Excellent. Well, thanks for those extra details. Um, the audience is um, sharing some thank yous in the chat, and I share that. Uh, thank you very much, Peggy, for sharing this tool. Yeah. Uh, this specifically was a new one for me, so um, yeah. I enjoyed getting to see it in action and um, getting my, my ideas spinning for how I might adopt or adapt it, and I bet our audience is feeling the same. Yeah, it's good to connect with everyone. I'm here in Texas, so... <laughs> Thanks, y'all. All right. Well, um, if you have any more questions, we do still have a couple more minutes to leave the room open. Um, and uh, Peggy did share a link to her slides. Maybe, Peggy, if you wouldn't mind sharing that link sure. one more time for those who might have um, joined a bit late. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, as I mentioned, this session and all of the live sessions from this year's Electronic Village are available on YouTube and being added as we are conducting these sessions during the convention. And I will also add a link um, to the Electronic Village homepage. Um, so you are welcome to explore both the live and asynchronous um, resources that we have put together for you all in the Electronic Village. Um, not only do we have these fun interactive live sessions, but we have a lot of things that uh, you can explore in your own time, um, both during and after the convention. So um, please do have a look. And as you can see, there are many ways to um, stay current on what the Computer Assisted Language Learning Interest section uh, is doing and has to offer for you. Um, so please do um, take the chance to uh, follow some of the ways we share our information.